Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and, and one of our mentors, Dr. Joel Howell, who will be uh, offering our morning uh, address. He's the Victor Vaughn Professor of the History of Medicine at the University of Michigan here. Um, and he's also a professor in the Departments of Internal Medicine at the School of Medicine, History in the College of Liter Literature, Science, and Arts, and Health Services, Management and Policy at the School of Public Health. Dr. Howell got his MD and completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Chicago, and then went on to the University of Pennsylvania to the Center for the Department of History and Sociology where he got his PhD. And he was also a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar uh, there. Currently, he's the director of the program in Society of Medicine and the associate chair in the Department of History. Prior to that, from 1993 to 2007, he directed the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program here at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Howell studies um, the history of medical technology, um, looking at how social contextual factors shape the diffusion and its clinical application, and that's really where his research, and, and looking at where and why and how American medicine has really been linked so intimately and almost become obsessed with uh, science and technology. Um, uh, he's a practicing internist, both here in the outpatient and inpatient settings, and he regularly teaches at the medical school, the public health school, the College of Literature, Science, and Arts, uh, and uh, the law school. Um, he's, uh, uh, his funding comes from a variety of sources, most recently the Association for Performing Arts Presenters Creative Campus Innovations Grant Program, which is founded by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Joel Howell. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, the first thing I want to say is just wow. I, I, want, I want to offer my congratulations to the conference organizers who have put together a, a truly spectacular conference. And uh, I kind of was there at the very beginning of this thing and saw, heard some of the ideas. And it hasn't been entirely a, a smooth course to where we are today. But I think that uh, you guys should feel very proud and very, very good about what you've done uh, for everybody here and for, and for the field in general. So. Congratulations. I am going to be talking probably a little bit differently than most of the other talks that you've heard. Um, the title of my talk is Bioethics in a World of Mechanical Medicine. And the assumption of this talk is that biomedicine and medicine and bioethics are obsessed with the belief that machines and science somehow hold the secret to better health care. I'm going to suggest that this is central to our understanding of our current system of health care delivery and for thinking about the role of specific religious traditions therein. Now, this is a bold statement that we're obsessed with this idea, uh, but I'll stand by it. Consider the following. What do you think about measuring blood pressure? Do you think we should measure blood pressure just by feeling the pulse or just by taking it with a swing manometer? What about fever? You think we should diagnose fever by looking at somebody and asking them how they feel and seeing if they're sweating, or do you think we ought to use a thermometer to, make, to get a number? What about anemia? Is anemia something that we diagnose by how people feel, or do we need a blood count? What about broken bones? Should we get an x-ray, or should we just rely on talking and feeling the patient? I think that I'm on pretty firm ground that everybody in this room, or almost everybody, would feel more comfortable in each of these situations using some kind of science and technology to arrive at this diagnosis. And in that sense, I think that our faith and our belief in science and technology is like so many faiths and beliefs and that we don't question it because we were brought up in an environment in which that assumption was taken for granted. Put it another way, we share a secular faith in science and machines. And as was mentioned in the introduction, what I've been trying to do for the past several decades is understand how we came to this belief. Now note that understanding how we came to this belief, this faith, this secular religious faith in science and technology, is not to say that it is true or false, that it is useful or not useful. Trying to understand why you believe something is not, says nothing about whether or not that belief is true. And I think histor hist a historical analysis is often the best way to get to that. Now, it was not always thus. <laughs> If we look back to the very early years of the scientific revolution, if we look back to some of the fundamental discoveries, let's say the circulation of the blood, the idea that the heart pumps blood around and around the body, rather than having that blood spontaneously generated. If we look at the investigators who came up with this notion, originally in the 13th century, 
Ibn al-Nifas working in Egypt and later in the 17th century, William Harvey working in England. We see that although they use quantitative scientific arguments, in no way do they see their discussion as being distinct from religion. In fact, they said very explicitly that the role of their scientific experiments was to unpack the greater glory of God, was to discover what he has created in his wisdom. Now, in so doing, and this often goes unnoted, they asked us to substitute one faith for another faith. The idea that the blood was being continuously created depended upon the existence of invisible holes in the septum of the heart. They said there are no, there are no such holes. They said instead the blood goes through the lungs. And this depended upon the existence of invisible holes in the alveoli of the lungs. There were no microscopes. Nobody could see these pores. They were several centuries away from the demonstration of the root of their argument. Yet people took these arguments on faith, on belief, on the notion that this was somehow true, even though it could not be shown. I'd like to move now to the early 20th century in the United States and spend some time on a truly radical medical technology and point out some of the questions that were asked about this technology. And what I'm going to suggest, basically, is that the questions that were asked then are similar to the questions that we're asking today. In 1895, a German physicist by the name of Wilhelm Conrad Rankin was messing around with a cathode ray tube that looked something like this. He discovered that with this tube, he was able to penetrate solid objects and create shadows beyond. He took a picture of his wife's hand that you see here. And on Christmas Day, 1895, he mailed that picture all around the world. This was a picture that changed the world. It was a radical transformation. Nobody had ever seen an x-ray before, but suddenly we could see inside the human body. And there was an enormous outpouring of interest. Within a year, there were 49 books and over 200 articles written about the x-ray. Think about in, in 1895, what kind of an outpouring that was. Now, why was this such a radical image? First of all, it was a way of looking inside the body. Yes, you say, but people had looked inside the body before. Surgeons had gone and looked inside the body. People had made drawings of inside the body. This was different, and it was different in four very important ways. Number one, the images were not particularly detailed. Right? I mean, if you're trying to understand what the interior of the human body looks like from a surgical standpoint, it's messy. You know, you look at pictures, they don't look like what the real inside look like, looks like. Number two, the x-ray was itself a photograph. It was in black and white, and it was two-dimensional, and it was easy to reproduce, and it was easy to create. And that's why it spread all around the world and had the kind of impact on popular thought that it did. The machines were not hard to make. Here you see an early x-ray machine. People set up studios everywhere. It was not originally a medical device. It was a physics device. Uh, the story of how it became a medical device is actually pretty interesting, but we don't have time to go into it today. How did people respond to these images? What did this image mean? I want to spend some time thinking about this, because this is the introduction of a brand new technology. And part of it was empathic. Take a look at this picture. This is an x-ray of a chest. What, how do you feel? What do you think this shows? Well, in The Magic Mountain, the classic book by Thomas Mann, Hans Kostorf, the protagonist, has a picture of his beloved. He's in a tuberculosis sanitarium. And it says, he drew out his keepsake, his treasure, a thin glass plate which must be held towards the light to see anything on it. It was Claudia's x-ray portrait, showing not her face, but the delicate bony structure of the upper half of her body and the organs of the thoracic cavity surrounded by the pale, ghost-like envelope of flesh. How often had he looked at it how often pressed it to his lips. So to some people, this was a beautiful image. And people had x-ray portraits taken at these x-ray stands and gave them to their friends, gave them to their spouses, gave them to their lovers. But the image was complicated, and it could be complicated even amongst the same protagonist. On the one hand, the x-ray was an image of great beauty. On the other hand, Take a look at this image. It could be the harbinger of death. 
The process of decay was forestalled by the light ray. The flesh in which he walked disintegrated, annihilated, dissolved in vacant mist. And there within it was the finely turned skeleton of his own hand. The seal ring he had inherited from his grandfather hanging loose and black on the joint of his ring finger, a hard material object with which man adorns the body that is fated to melt away beneath it when it passes on to yet another flesh that can wear it for yet a little while. He gazed at this familiar part of his own body, and the fir for the first time in his life, he understood that he would die. So the x-ray is both an object of beauty and a harbinger of death. And I love the image he gives this there of the ring passing on from one person to another, symbolic of relationships between human beings but yet also indicative of the ring moving from one person to another. The x-ray could be seen in other lights. The issue of privacy was huge in the, when the x-ray was invented. Uh, privacy was, it, it was there for a couple of reasons. One was there were new machines that were being invented. The phonograph machine uh, was being invented. The photography had suddenly become easier to do. The telephone could bring people up in the very bosom of their families, it was said, and, and invade your privacy that way. The notion of who owns images, very famous Supreme Court case involving someone who took a picture of a little girl and put it on a bag of flour to sell their flour, and the question was, who owned that image? There was no law at that point that said you had a right to your image. The Supreme Court had to rule on that. In that context, the x-ray was seen not unsurprisingly as a threat to privacy, and I'm going <coughs> to show you some examples. This is from Punch Magazine. It's the March of Science, and it shows that you can see somebody peering through a keyhole with x-ray vision. Here's a poem that was published. We do not want, like Dr. Swift, to take our flesh off and to pose in our bones or show each little rift and joint for you to poke your nose in. We only crave to contemplate each other's usual full dress photo, referring there to the x-ray photos. Your worst than altogether state of portraiture we bar in toto. Let's get there. Um, people were concerned about the use of the x-ray in public places, the use of x-ray glasses. The New Jersey, New Jersey legislature on the 19th of February, 1896, heard a bill introduced by a, an assemblyman Reed of Somerset County to ban the use of x-ray glasses in theaters or other public places. Technology could be a threat to privacy. People sold lead-lined underwear in an attempt to guard against that. And for many years, the purveyors of magazines designed for consumption by prepubescent teenage boys <laughs> saw the opportunity to have x-ray vision instantly available or x-ray spectacles guaranteed. And of course, what Assemblyman Reed feared and what these boys sought to buy uh, exists even today. I flew back from San Diego yesterday, and those of you that have flown recently know that we now go through machines that, in fact, show images of the body that are, in fact, more detailed than this, but for purposes of an uh, academic audience, I didn't show those pictures. What else could the x-ray mean? This is technology. This is new technology. When it's introduced into society, what does it mean? What is the inner self? What does it mean to really know what's going on deep inside human, by, human beings' minds? Thomas Edison originally tried to use the x-ray to take x-ray pictures of the brain. Here's another cartoon from Punch. The new photographic discovery allows the German emperor to look at the symbol of England and see that he really does have a true backbone. But here's a, here's a somewhat deeper comment. This is another poem. And I think we can learn a lot about popular perceptions of technology by looking at poems, even though they're not great poetry. This is. To a fickle miss, not worth your while, that false sweet smile which o'er your features plays. Thy heart of steel I can reveal by my cathodic rays. I can see right through you. You're being nice, but you don't really mean it. So this suggests then what is, what's important about being a person? Where does, where, where does one's truth lie? Is it, is it the superficial self that we show to everybody else in our day-to-day -day activities? Or is this the deep self? Is this the real self? And our inner self, perhaps, is the more superficial. You say that's a silly question. Of course, the inner self is the more meaningful. That's a choice. 
And history is filled with contingent choices about what's real and what's not and what's important and what's not. And new technologies play into how we make those choices every day. I want to say a few more words about its use in clinical care, which is the example I used earlier. This is uh, for the non-clinicians in the room. Um, if you look on the right-hand side, this is somebody's leg. And if you can see that jagged piece in between, it's not supposed to be like that. Uh, this is a fairly badly broken bone. X-rays were originally used to diagnose broken bones. And if you look at the very first court case in which they were used in Denver in 1896, it's a question about whether or not the X-ray should be introduced. And the judge said, we have been presented with a photograph taken by means of a new scientific discovery. It knocks at the temple of learning. What shall we do or say? Close fast the doors or open wide the portal? So this is faith in science. What should we do or say? Close the doors or open wide the portal? This is new. This is scientific. This must be good. This is an assumption that we have lived with for over a century. Faith in science. There was considerable pushback to using the x-ray. I'll just show you very briefly. These are some numbers that show the people who have fractures who got an x-ray at the hospital. And you'll see that even after the x-ray is originally invented, very few people get it. More get it as they go along. But I, when I was trying to figure out why the more people got it at first, I started looking at patient records. And I think they tell us something as well. This is a case record from the Pennsylvania Hospital. This one is from the early, from about 1895, or is this 1902? I forget which one I put up here. <laughs> it's a fracture of the femur from 1902. Uh, you can read the details if you wish, but the point is this is a case record in which the clinician simply wrote what was going on with the patient. Wrote in free text, this is what I see, this is what I experience. That has changed. And it's changed in ways that reflect the use of technology, and it's changed in ways that shape the ways in which we as clinicians, and I know there are many clinicians here in the room, take care of patients. What do I mean by that? So here's another record from later on, and this is a patient with some findings of the chest. Rather than drawing a picture of their chest, there's a stamp there of the thorax on which people have laid various descriptions. Now, I would argue that it's demonstrably the case that not everybody's thorax is exactly the same. And I would say that rather than simply being a time-saving device for the clinician to avoid having to draw a picture of the thorax, what this does implicitly is focus attention on the inner organs of the body, on the organs that can be seen with an x-ray. It focuses attention away from seeing the person as Joel Howell, a 57-year-old guy who has, the following, you know, who has the following sets of beliefs, and focuses attention instead on what's going on in my inner organs. And that, I would argue, is a values-based choice with profound implications for decision-making. It's a choice. Let me show you some other examples, uh, all taken from the same period. This is early. So here's an x-ray report. You might think this kind of checkoff report um, is new with the use of computers. No, this is, this is from very early in the 20th century. Again, instead of describing the x-ray, you simply check off its characteristics. Instead of talking about the diet, you put numbers in a chart. Instead of talking about urine output, you create a graph. In this way, I think, do people become numbers? Do patients become organs? And does our view of the human being change from a contextual one in which values and religious beliefs and thoughts and ideas and relationships become important and focuses us instead on a, on a world in which numbers and science and objectivity become important. Let me say I don't, again, I'm not, believe it or not, I'm not making a value judgment. If, I'm gonna, if I should fall ill uh, today, and I hope I don't, but I might, and I am taken to a hospital, I would like to be cared for with medicine of the 21st century. I do not, I am not saying take me back and treat me like it was 100 years ago. But what I am saying is we made choices 100 years ago and those choices continue to reverberate. Here's a um, annual report from that same hospital. Annual reports are ways of advertising your hospital to get uh, funding. You'll notice what's being highlighted here, it's machines. <coughs> You'll notice what's absent here it's people. This goes along with the, this is an example of how medicine has come to be seen. You know, the physician, the books representing knowledge, 
the microscope, defining it by technology. Hospitals were another great innovation of the early 20th century. Prior to then, the average 19th century physician would spend her or his entire life in the United States never setting foot in a hospital, probably never even seeing a hospital. Here are the numbers. In 1873, the entire country had 178 hospitals. In 1909, that had exploded. Part of the reason for that explosion was the use of medical technology, things like x-ray machines that had to exist in a specific place. The number of beds goes up as well. Many of these hospitals had explicit religious intent. They were formed by various religious groups, oftentimes because they were minority religious groups who felt afraid, perhaps with good reason, that their particular beliefs would not be appropriately tended to, or worse, that it, as death neared, that people would attempt to proselytize and convert members of one religion to a member to believe in another religion. But I'm not talking specifically about religiosity. I'm also talking about the secular religion inherent in the use of science and technology. And many of you may recognize this hospital. It still exists. It's surrounded by a lot of other very tall buildings now. Um, this is the New York Hospital when it was first built on the Upper East Side of New York City. And the caption at the time, not added by me, was, it rises like a prayer for healing. So the notion that the hospital is serving a religious function is not one that I'm laying on there. It's one that was believed at the time. I'd like to end by showing you a few images. Well, I got one other point. And the point of these images is the centrality of technology in our 20th century understanding of medicine. Look at what's at the center of this picture. This is a primary care physician examining an infant. And yet at the very center of it is the stethoscope which we don't think of as high technology, but that also was new at this period. Here we see the doctor at the center of a massive group of technological tools. Here we see, again, the general practitioner sitting in what's at the middle of his, uh, of his desk. It's the microscope. Again, it's the notion that we define medicine by the use of science and technology. And we do that to the extent that when you see a classic picture such as this one, the family medicine physician trudging to yet another visit. What's striking here, what, pick, what we pick up on, is the idea that he's not carrying any technology. He's not using any new machines. What about this, this x-ray, this invisible beam, this soothing beam, because it makes the pain go away from painful tissue? One of the things that we need to never lose track of is that machines and science and technology is a value neutral proposition. People started using these machines. And one of the ways you would check to see if the machine was putting it, they were, first of all, they were called the soothing beam, because if you had painful tissue, exposure to an x-ray would cause the pain to go away. And radiologists would have a tube. And the way if you learned if your tube was putting out good x-rays or not is you put your hand in front of the tube. And if your hand turned kind of pink, that meant that it was getting out good x-rays and you, the tube was a good tube to use. And if you look at, ex, at famous radiologists of the period, you see pictures such as this one. You'll notice that his hand is bandaged. And the reason his hand is bandaged is because if you put your hand in front of the tube, you develop carcinomas and other problems. And within a decade or so, the newspapers were filled with headlines, death from new radium tubes, noted radiologist falls in prime of life man who gave his life for science dead at the age of 44. Not far from here, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century did an incredible work of art uh, that raises some of these same points. This is part of the Detroit Garden Court. This is what it looks like in situ at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, I know we have guests here from out of town. Uh, if there's any way you can possibly get there, this is the, like any great work of art. For me to show you slides is maybe one one thousandth of what it's like to appreciate the actual, the actual work of art. This is by Diego Rivera, one of the great Mexican muralists, one of the triumvirate of great Mexican muralists of the early 20th century, or mid 20th century. <clears throat> it's four walls, and I want to focus on this wall briefly, and I want to focus on the two panels you see in the upper right and in the upper left. Because Diego Rivera was very attuned to the notion that science 
and industry and technology could be used both for good and for evil. And if we look up in the upper right and focus our attention, well, that's, sorry, this is, this is an example of Diego Rivera put him, putting himself in the, in the frame. We hear, see here science being used for good. We see an infant being immunized. We see cows and horses and pigs representing the creation of vaccine sera, which was going on not far from where this image was being created on the walls of the Detroit Institute of Art. And we see the positive uses of science. And we see at the bottom the healthy placenta. We see healthy cells. But if you look on the upper left, what you see is science being used for evil. You see the, the creation of poison gas. This was a fresco that was done in between the two world wars. And in the First World War, poison gas was one of the brand new inventions of modern science and technology. And you see dying cells down below. Of course, one of the great complexities of, the, of this uh, poison gas is that a few years later, uh, poison gas was one of the first chemotherapeutic agents to start to be used. So I am going to show you just a few images here artistic images to show how the x-ray has been used, the idea of seeing the body through the x-ray. This is by a Chicago painter by the name of Roger Brown. And I find this a very, very moving series of images. This is supposed to depict someone with cancer, with lung cancer. And we see here the hand, both the hand with the skeleton and the harbinger of death, but we also see the hands as the symbols of touching. We see the hands put across somebody's chest in a very caring kind of response. We see the person going bald, and at the very end here in the lower right, we see the two hands reaching out to each other. And you can interpret that as you will, where there's a gesture of caring amongst two human beings, whether it's some deity reaching down to someone who is dying or who has just died. And like any great work of art, I think the, these images are susceptible to multiple meanings. I think they certainly reflect the idea that the x-ray has become part of the popular culture in which we live. This is one that just shows, I think, the beauty of the x-ray. Um, this, this is an image that hangs at the University of Miami. It's by a woman named Tatiana Parcero. It's called Cartographia Interior from 1996. She's an artist from Buenos Aires. And this gets, again, to this notion of who is the true person? Who's the inner person? What she's done is overlay her body here with images and texts from the Aztec world, from her own writings. And the question this raises then is that tension. Is the real her the interior her, or is the real her the exterior her? And if she has to lay the images on her body, is this a, is this a sign that if she doesn't do that, her true inner self isn't taken seriously? I don't know. Um, like Again, like any great work of art, I think that... Um, it has many meanings, and I think it raises all kinds of questions about technology and science and what it means to live in a world that's dominated by them. Our discussions of bioethics and religion cannot help but be informed by these obsessions with science and technology. It's worth noting where we are, where this conference is, who's sponsoring it, the fact that we're sitting here in the middle of a very large research-intensive biomedical institution is, is not coincidental. Again, I'm not attacking or defending that choice, but simply pointing out that the fact that we're here, the fact that we privilege science and technology, is the result of a number of choices that have been made throughout the course of the 20th century and will continue to be made. I'll simply point out one other one. Uh, this medical center, like so many medical centers, depends to a great extent on the funding through the National Institutes of Health. Um, the National Institutes of Health, you may be surprised to learn, is a relatively new invention. Um, Vannevar Bush, in 1945, proposed it in his famous text, Science, the Endless Frontier. And spending since then on extramural research has increased nearly 4,000-fold. And that's an inflation-adjusted dollars. So adjusting for inflation, NIH funding has gone up by a factor of 4,000. And what has it done for us? It has done a number of wonderful things, but we fund NIH and we support a lot of the basic research that goes on because of faith in the belief that science and technology will improve our health. I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience that the United States is by far the highest in healthcare spending. 
among the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's OCED countries, we are two and a half times the average in terms of our healthcare spending, and yet we're somewhere around 24th out of 30 in terms of most markers of our actual health. So clearly there is a disconnect here between the enormous amounts of money we spend on basic science research and our actual health. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Again, I'm not here to make that judgment, but simply to point out that the reason we do that, the reason we support that kind of research is because we have a secular religious faith in the power of science and the power of machines and the power of technology. How does all this help us in our discussions at this meeting? I think it helps us to realize that our current world is the result of choices. It helps us to point out that we have made choices in the past. We're going to make choices in the future, even when we don't realize it. And to the extent that we realize that there are multiple options available to us, I think it strengthens our ability to do what's right as we move forward. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if there is any time, I don't know if there's time for questions or discussion. Thanks so much. Both fascinating and, I think, very moving. We have a, a, a time for maybe a question or two. Do we have any questions at this moment? We have one right over here. I really enjoyed your talk. That was a oh, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious why you view it as a choice of faith versus discovering good science in a more objective way. So take sorry, this. I, I, as, why I view it as a, as a what? A, a choice of faith okay. in science versus the power of science to tell us something about the inside of the human body and how to heal it. So you have the same ends for medicine across cultures and, and uh, times. And so if you take a hospital in Tibet doing traditional Tibetan medicine, they still have a contemporary emergency medical center with doctors trained at Harvard Medical Center. They use x-rays to set bones. And when I interview the doctors, they're like, of course we use x-rays. You can set a bone so much better. Um, they use their herbal remedies too and their traditional remedies too. But they superimpose what you scientific biomedicine on the traditional system. You find this in India as well, with the Indian uh, medical system. And so it seems that there is an objectivity here that's missed in the idea that it's just an act of faith in the power of science. Thank you. I, I think you make, you make a very good point. A um, couple of things. First of all, one of, one, of the, one of the features of contemporary society is that you can hold multiple belief systems at the same time. So for example, um, just because you believe in the power of antibiotics doesn't believe that you're not also going to believe in the power of prayer, for example. And to say that you believe in one doesn't mean you don't believe in the other. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, when I say faith in science, I mean I, was, I refer to the NIH, which funds basic science research. It funds research on the fundamental nature of human disease. I would argue that if you look at population-based health, that we have yet to see the payoff for much of that funding of basic molecular mechanisms. Will we? We may. I believe we probably will. I have no objective evidence for that. And that's part of why I call it faith. And part of it, and I kind of ran through that in a hurry, is when you look at this transition in the early 20th century, there is no evidence whatsoever that you're actually getting better health care for that introduction of science and technology. And yet people bought into it. The, uh, the hospital that rises like a pr prayer for healing, that hospital was built before antibiotics were in use. Right? They believed that it was useful. Uh, the x-ray, uh, while useful in some ways, I mean, one could make, also make the argument, again, I, I will make a, a, an outrageous plug here for my own book, uh, Technology in the Hospital, Johns Hopkins Press, 1995. Uh, <laughs> that's the year it was, it was, that it was uh, published, not the price. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I, I go into some detail about the fact that when the x-ray is first invented, it's not clear that it's actually doing any good in terms of helping pe take care of people, yet people buy into it. That's a short answer to a complicated and good question. We have one more question. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. You had mentioned um, uh, some numbers there, and some numbers come to my mind. Uh, Medicare has a budget of $400 billion, a quarter of which is spent um, at, during the last one year of patients' lives. 40% of it in the last one month. So what, what I get conflicted about is the, the sheer failure of technology is astounding. And if, if the goal was to really extend life. And the ethical question in my mind is, is, is if indeed the sanctity of life is, is, is what's in question, then technology must and shall be used to make patients comfortable enough to go through this natural course. Uh, of the lifetime, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. 
Uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I'll simply say I fully agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. Thanks so much again. Please welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you.